Good morning, everyone. We're uh, in our general chemistry lab once again, and today we're discussing the experiment titled Monitoring Acid Base Titrations with the pH Meter. You are, of course, familiar with the basic concept of titration. Um, I can remind you here that uh, usually you have two solutions participating in the reaction. Uh, we're talking about acid base, so one would be an acid, the other one would be a base. The solution added from a burette to a solution in a flask and, or in a beaker. The uh, solution for added from the burette is called a titrant. And here we're uh, going to look at how titration can be monitored um, with a pH meter and the, as a result a titration curve can be constructed. The goal of this experiment is to compare and contrast two types of titrations. First one we're going to consider is a titration of a strong acid such as HCl with a strong base and AOH. So sodium hydroxide in AOH is going to be our titrant, it's going to be placed in the burette, and hydrochloric acid is going to, place, to be placed in the beaker. Here I have a um, simplified or molecular version of the chemical equation that shows that uh, NaOH and HCl react producing sodium chloride and water. And uh, here we need to define a very important notion when uh, titration is discussed, which is equivalence point. Equivalence point in the titration, especially in titration where one mole of each acid and base is present, can be defined as a situation where moles of acid that was originally present in the beaker or flask is exactly equal to moles of base added from the burette. At this point, of course, um, the very important thing to remember is that there is no HCl present in the flask or beaker anymore because all of the HCl has reacted and has been turned into the products, which are sodium chloride and water in this case. And there is also no sodium hydroxide present in the beaker either because we added just enough sodium hydroxide to neutralize the acid and literally not any excess. So one important point that I'd like to once again reiterate, which um, I'm doing because I know a lot of times people struggle with this, is that at equivalence point, there is no acid in the beaker and there is no base. The only uh, species present in the solution at equivalence point would be products, salt and water. And so when you're asked about uh, what happens in solution at equivalence point, what the pH is, what the species are, you should not even think about any of the reactants, all the products. So because we're talking about strong acid, strong base titration, here the salt is sodium chloride. As we talked about in the previous experiment, sodium chloride is a salt produced by a strong base and a strong acid. And it is a neutral salt, so pH, the equivalent point in this titration, would be expected to be 7. This is the... Uh, hypothetical titration curve that um, I copied from your lab manual and I'd like to discuss a couple of things about it and show you how you would analyze a titration curve. Uh, there's a lot of information you can deduct from it if you know where to look and you know what to look for. So first of all, let's say we didn't know what was uh, being titrated by what here. What if you weren't told, you were just were given this equivalence, uh, I'm sorry, this titration curve, and you were asked, so what's going on here? First thing you do is you look right here at zero, um, this is volume of titrant, by the way. What if you weren't told this was an AOH, right? What if you weren't told this was HCl being titrated by an AOH? So first thing you would look at is um, point in the titration where zero milliliters of titrant has been added. What does that mean? Well, it means at this point, what you have in your beaker is just the solution being titrated. And at this point, you can see that at zero milliliters titrant added, the pH is one. What does that tell you, pH of one? It tells you that you are A, dealing with an acid for sure, because pH is so low, and B, because pH is only one, and say it's 0.1 molar acid, then it tells you it's a strong acid. There is no way 
a weak acid would have such a low pH and a concentration of about 0.1 molar. And so you know that you're uh, titrating a strong acid. Then you're looking at um, the next point you're looking at is right here where titration is basically over, all the way up here. I can't quite reach, of course. But what do you see? You see that pH went up to about 12. Now, uh, can you make any conclusions about what the titrant was if you didn't know? Um, I would argue that you could. Um, assuming it's a strong base, right? Uh, 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide, if you had pure 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide, would have concentration of hydroxide ions of 0.1 molar, which means POH would be one, which means pH would be about 13. However, here it's 12, but you have to remember that base is being added to a solution of acid, so uh, the volume is basically doubling, and so the concentration of hydronium ion or hydroxide ion is affected by it, and so the pH as high as 12 definitely suggests that strong base was being used as a titrant here. So uh, once we figure that out, what, uh, what kind of information can we get from the titration curve? Well, when the titration curve like this is being constructed, you can see that initially when base uh, is being added to the acid, pH stays um, about the same for a while. This here is because uh, at this point there is a large excess of acid still present in the beaker and all the base that's added up to this point basically is neutralized by the acid and base is um, a limiting reactant. But then you start noticing pH quickly rising here. This is because acid is quickly getting to a point where it's almost completely used up and eventually pH keeps rising above seven. This is where no acid is present. Equivalence point is passed. And at that point, you're basically accumulating excess of base. So uh, how would one go about making a titration curve? Well, in your experiment in the data sheets, you will see that you have two trials for this titration. So you will not, of course, be able to do real titration, but uh, I provided um, a simulator, link to a simulator under modules, and that's how you're gonna get your data. And here's what I suggest. In the first trial, what you'll wanna do is add about um, as much as one or maybe two milliliters at the time. I don't quite remember what the options there are, but you can do quite a bit of um, base addition all the way through. And what you will see is that uh, you will have gaps here because pH changes very quickly, right around the equivalence point. And then for the second titration, you want to uh, change your settings so you're adding less uh, than one milliliter at a time. So you can get many points, as many points as possible, right over here, so you can construct a titration curve as uh, precisely as you can. So if, um, you're going to only make the titration curve for the second trial of your simulated titration where sodium hydroxide is added in smaller portions so that as many data points as possible exist right in this area where a um, portion of the titration curve is almost vertical. Another point, of course, to make here is that the titration curve like this allows you to um, figure out two things. Of course, pH the equivalence point can be found from the titration curve and volume of titrant required to get there also. So how do you do that? Well, this diagram illustrates this. You would take a ruler and you would expand this portion of the curve here and you would extend the upper part of the curve there and then you would draw the vertical line like this and then you'd find the middle of that line. And where the middle of the vertical line is, is your uh, equivalence point. And then you can extrapolate over to y-axis and it gives you the pH value. And then down here is your volume of um, titrant required to get there. So this is um, classic titration of a strong acid by a strong base resulting solution at the equivalence point contains only neutral salt. As a result, pH is seven at the equivalence point. One other thing I wanted to point out that the simulator allows you to select an indicator for the titration. 
so you can actually monitor how indicator color will change as pH of the solution changes. And at that point, you will pick phenol thallium, and you will see that the original phenol thallium, of course, is colorless and acid. It will remain colorless. Um, even uh, when you keep seven, it will still be colorless because phenol thallium is colorless in neutral medium. But as soon as pH reaches over seven, phenol thallium should turn to pink. So you will notice here that um, at equivalence point, phenol thallium actually has not, will, will not have changed color just yet. And you will remember when we did the titration of HCl with an AOH or any strong acid with an AOH and chem 1240, we told you that you cannot overshoot, you cannot go to very pink color, you need a very uh, light pink. And that's because even when uh, phenol thallium is light pink, it means pH is already slightly above seven. So even with light pink color, you sort of end up over titrating. So next we're going to um, consider the second uh, titration, where we are titrating a weak acid such as acetic acid by a strong base such as sodium hydroxide. Once again, we're starting with the chemical equation, acetic acid and sodium hydroxide neutralization reaction, once again, producing salt and water. So in this case, the salt, of course, is sodium acetate. You can also write this equation in uh, ionic form, acetic acid, the weak acid reacting with hydroxide from an AOH. Hydroxide acts as a base, this is an acid. Bronsted acid donates a proton to the bronsted base. You get acetate ion and water. So this is molecular form of this equation. This is ionic form of this equation. Showing um, this reaction from the point of view of bronsted acid base theory. So what is going on in this titration? Well, you still have an acid in the base. You still get salt and water as products. However, will pH be still seven? in this titration. I hope you, you remember that we talked about the fact that all salts are not created equal and the fact that not all salts are neutral. And in this case, uh, the salt that's produced at equivalence point, sodium acetate, is definitely not neutral. And so we can expect a pH different from seven at equivalence point. However, once again, I want to remind you that in any titration, Talking about the equivalence point, we expect no reactants to be present. All acid has been neutralized, no excess of base has been added. Moles of acid and base are equal, so neither acid nor base are present in the beaker. So what is present in the beaker? What's present is sodium acetate. Here I wrote it in ionic form because it is, of course, a strong electrolyte, so it breaks down into sodium ions and acetate ions. So there is absolutely no acetic acid in solution at close point, nor there is any main wage. So we did talk about the fact that sodium acetate is a basic salt. Sodium acetate was one of the salts whose pH uh, we measured. And we talked about the fact that sodium acetate is produced by a strong base and a weak acid, and therefore it is expected to be a basic salt. In lecture, you also consider what's called hydrolysis of salts. Hydrolysis, of course, is a reaction with water, as we talked about early in the semester. And here, um, you can see how this reaction happens between acetate ion and water. Again, it's bronsted acid-based chemistry. Water is going to act as an acid. Acetate is a conjugate base of a weak acid, so it has basic properties. So acetate is going to act as a base. Because water acts as a bronsted acid, water is going to donate a proton to acetate. And what you're getting here is acetic acid and, I underlined it here, hydroxide ion. Uh, any presence of hydroxide ion in solution uh, in the excess of hydronium ion represents basic medium. So this hydroxide here explains why Sodium acetate is a basic salt. Again, this is because acetate ion is able to act as a base due to the fact that it's a conjugate base of a weak acid. The weaker the acid, the stronger the conjugate base. 
So uh, acetate here acts as a base reacting with water producing hydroxide. And so at this point, when we consider what happens at the uh, equivalence point of the titration of acetic acid with an AOH, we expect the pH at the equivalence point to be above 7, probably somewhere between 8 and 9. Um, your book does contain a diagram for this titration. I apologize, kind of copied it a little crookedly, but we can still uh, hopefully use it. And uh, we're going to consider this hypothetical titration curve and compare it with the previous one we looked at for the strong acid being titrated. So once again, let's imagine we were not told what is being titrated by what here. We have to figure it out from the titration curve. Again, first thing we look at is uh, what pH is at zero titrate added. Of course, uh, we know it's an acid present in the beaker being titrated by the base. How do we know that? Well, pH is increasing for one, right? So uh, pH can only increase when the base is added. So we're starting with just acid in the beaker here, zero uh, base added. And you can see pH in this titration to start is about three. In fact, if you do the math for 0.1 molar acidic acid, knowing its Ka value, you will find that pH is expected to be something like 2.75 or something like that, close to 2.8. This, of course, is uh, roughly three here. So um, compare and contrast that with the starting pH of the first titration we looked at. In the first titration, the starting pH was as low as one because it was a strong acid that dissociated completely and produced a lot of hydronium ion. Here, we're talking about the weak acid which uh, dissociates very little. As a result, the pH of this acid is much higher. Remember, the um, lower the concentration of hydronium ion, the higher the pH. So pH here is much higher than uh, in the previous titration. However, when you look up here for the final part of the titration, when uh, a large excess of titrant or NaOH is added, you can see that uh, this portion of the curve is very similar to the first one. Why is that? Well, because at this point we still have excess of titrant, and because pH is so high, as high as 12, we can uh, definitely say that this was a strong base being added to the acid. So this part of the curve is very similar to the first one we looked at. What's very different though is this portion of the curve right here. You'll notice it is of course shorter because we're starting at a higher pH, but you'll also hopefully notice, and you should take a very careful look at that, is that this portion of the curve is, is not as steep as the uh, one we looked at for the strong acid. So let's first talk about um, how you should do this for your simulator. Once again, two determinations. You'll switch the acid to acidic acid. You'll adjust the concentration of the acid in the base to 0.1 molar for both. You will still pick phenolphthalein as your indicator. And then for the first trial, you'll be adding uh, as much as one, maybe two milliliters at a time of uh, base to your acid. And then in the second determination, you'll cut down the um, volume added at a time to much smaller. Um, value and uh, add as little as many points, one millimeter, so you can get as many points as possible right here. So what do we do with this curve? How do we use it? Well, first we can find the pH equivalence point. Again, draw this line here, extending this portion of the curve of tangent with the ruler, and then uh, line up there, extending the upper part of the curve, and then um, find the middle, in the middle of this distance between here and uh, up there will give you pH equivalence point, which is uh, somewhere between eight and nine. And then if you go down from that uh, point over here, you will find volume of base needed for the titration. So last uh, thing to discuss, but very important, is why this curve, unlike the first one we looked at, why is, uh, this curve um, seems to show somewhat of a gradual increase in pH 
the four balloons point hits compared to the first curve, which was pretty practically vertical and very abrupt change. Well, let's consider this portion of the titration curve right here. So before equivalence point, right here. So we start with just the acid. Then we add some base. And at this point, pH pretty much is not changing a lot. Why? Because we still have excess of acetic acid and all the NaOH we added will be consumed by the acid. But what is NaOH that we're adding, uh, what is it turned into? At this point, the NaOH that we're adding will react with acetic acid and form sodium acetate. But at this point right here, before this point is reached, we still have some acetic acid left over, right? Acetic acid is not uh, used up completely until we get to equivalence point. So here you have a situation where you have a combination. You have two um, chemicals present in your solution, two substances. You have leftover acetic acid that hasn't been used up yet, and you have some sodium acetate that's formed from the reaction of an AOH and acetic acid um, being combined. So what do you have? You have a weak acid, acetic acid, and sodium acetate, salt of that acid. That, of course, as we discussed in the previous lab, uh, constitutes a buffer solution. So at this point, you have buffering action taking place. The uh, remaining acid plus the salt of that acid that was produced in the reaction uh, combine to form a buffer which resists pH change. As a result, pH doesn't uh, increase as abruptly as it did in the first instance, which we considered. Uh, in titration of HCl with an AOH, there's absolutely no buffer. Here there is a buffer, and buffer happens to resist pH change, causing pH to increase at a much slower pace, if you will. So um, this titration here represents buffering region right here. One last thing I would add, and you um, hopefully will see it with your simulator, when you use phenol thiolene as an indicator, here the pH, the equivalence point of about 8.8 or between 8 and 9 in general, will match exactly to the point where phenol thiolene will change its color from colorless to pink. So phenol thiolene has what's called the end point, end point of an indicator, is pH when indicator changes color. And for phenol thiolene, the end point happens to be right around 8.5 or 8, between 8 and 9. And so for this titration, phenol thiolene is literally an ideal indicator because it will change color just as equivalence point occurs. In the previous titration, um, um, the end point of the indicator occurs slightly after equivalence point. Here, they basically coincide. So hopefully um, this introduction will help you um, use your simulator and figure out data. One last thing I would like to add when you're turning in your data sheets for this experiment. So data sheet one, two determinations. You can um, assume the concentrations of both acid and base. It's page 165 I'm looking at. Initial concentration of HCl and NaOH are both 0.100 molar. And then for um, the determinations, like I said, do the first determination quickly and the second, uh, second one a little slower so you can get um, more data points for a titration curve. You are only supposed to graph your second determination. Also, you may not have enough data points here, or enough room for all your data points for second determination. Um, that's fine, you can just um, add them on a separate sheet if you'd like. Because if you start adding base only uh, 0.1 milliliter at a time, you'll definitely run out the room in the second column. And then uh, on page 166 for part three, for titrating acetic acid with an AOH. Same thing, initial concentrations are both going to be 0 0.100 molar. And uh, also first determination, adding large 
proportions of base to the acid and second determinations uh, should be where you're adding fewer um, or smaller volume of an AOH at a time so you can get more points. Now, data sheet two, that's page 167. Uh, you're only supposed to do second determination for calculations. And here you get your pH, which is a starting point for all your calculation from the titration curve. So you have to make the titration curve first, then you look at pH at a certain point in the titration, and from there you find your hydronium ion and your hydroxide ion concentration. As far as making titration curves, you have two options. There's graph paper provided in the lab book, pages 168 and 169. So you can do it by hand, but I would definitely suggest maybe using um, MS Excel and uh, making those titration curves in Excel. You just do line and connect data points. And um, that would be probably the best time-saving option. Have a great week, everyone.